good morning good afternoon or good evening dear colleagues and other attendees it is my utmost pleasure to invite you and to formally begin this discussion on the book war by professor andrew clapen of graduate institute professor clapen has recently written this i would say masterpiece a very comprehensive book before i say a few words about the book let me present a few sentences on the illustrious career of professor clapen andrew clapen is professor of international law at the graduate institute of international and development studies in geneva which he joined in 1997 He has been a member of the UN Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan since October 2017. He is an honorary member of the International Commission of Jurists. In 2003, he was an advisor on international humanitarian law to Sergio Vieira de Mello, special representative of the UN Secretary General in Iraq. He is the author of various books. including realist law of nations and introduction to the role of law in international relations the seventh edition and co editor with paolo gaeta and marco sassuli of the 1949 geneva conventions a commentary his latest book which is the subject of today's discussion entitled war as i have already told you published by oup in last year now as the moderator of the session let me take this privilege of saying a few a very few words on this excellent book i think this is the first time in my entire career as a law student or a, as a student of law that i have seen a title so pithy in three letters encapsulating so much the book is very comprehensive it takes a very thorough look at what war entails and how the law has evolved and i think he masterfully has demonstrated although theoretically just war or unjust war those terms are outlawed war today is not really an option under international law force can only be used in two special narrowly defined circumstances our leaders at different phases in even contemporary world have re resorted to some form of use of force without really formally declaring war and trying in that process trying to get across certain international legal standards as if that when you can invoke the word war in some ways certain actions which would otherwise be outright illegal would be legalized we have, some of our political leaders have been so accustomed to this word or have been so fond of these words that even in the current pandemic some of them are invoking the word war on pandemic and i think anyone who would start reading this book no matter what discipline he comes from he or she comes from it would be really compelled to read it uh, he just you just cannot skim through it i look forward to professor clapen's discussion i look forward to the comments by my esteemed colleagues the two designated discussants and of course all the questions from you the attendees so i would now invite professor clapen to talk on his book professor clapen the floor is yours Well, thank you very much, Professor Rizwan Islam um, from the North South University, and thank you in advance to Professor Swazel and Dr. Sultana, who I understand are going to be making some comments, and Dr. Wahab, who will be concluding. This is really a wonderful opportunity for me to to hear your thoughts on the topic, and I'm very grateful already for the insights you gave in the introduction. And I really lo do look forward to a discussion and trying to answer your questions. and uh as you've uh, suggested professor islander 
book is addressed to various audiences. It's not only addressed to law students, but also anyone wanting to learn a bit about the topic of war. And at another level, I suppose it's also addressed to militaries around the world who um, sometimes seem to be under the perception that there aren't really any rules that apply and that everything is very ambiguous and indeterminate. And I've tried to show that actually there are some quite concrete and easily digestible rules. And then the third message, which I'm really trying to pass on, and I'm glad that you've picked it up, is that when a politician or a lawmaker or a judge uses the word war, we should be quite careful and, and think, you know, what are people trying to do when they invoke war? And as you've suggested, you know, it could be invoked the war on the pandemic or the war on cancer. And it gives a sense that, you know, we have to all get behind something and we have a common enemy. But in more political terms, when leaders use this word, they seem to be suggesting not only that everybody should get behind them, but that anybody who disagrees with them is treacherous or treasonous and potentially criminal, and that somehow they could be classed as an enemy within. And that's a very sort of dangerous situation to be in, because obviously you're shutting down a real discussion about whether it's appropriate to use violence or not. And so I wanted to really stress by picking such a short title that it's worth thinking about what happens when this word war gets invoked. And that's really one of the big themes um, of the book. And especially here, writing in Geneva, the word war tends not to be used. People talk about armed conflict and humanitarian situations. And I wanted to remind that uh, in war things happen and it's used as a, a rhetorical device, but also in some ways in quite a technical way. And I thought what I would do today with the particular panel you've assembled is maybe uh, go to some of that technical agenda that I have where I'm being quite transparent that I want to challenge some of the assumptions or, or tropes that surround the idea of what happens when war and law collide. And I'll try and keep this uh, simple and just go through five uh, of these assumptions or tropes and show what I've tried to explain in the book about why I differ from maybe what you could call the sort of conventional attitude. So this is really just a way of highlighting some of the more original arguments in the book. So the first uh, trope I would mention is that it's often said that declarations of war are no longer relevant and it changes nothing in law. And it's enough, as I say, just to talk about an armed conflict. But in fact, my research, and I wasn't sure what I was going to find when I started out on this project, but the book demonstrates that a declaration of war can be necessary to trigger certain legal results. Um, and the one that I highlight in particular is that in order to apply the death penalty in many states that have ratified certain human rights treaties, you would need a declaration of war Otherwise, the death penalty is going to be illegal because there is a reservation which says, well, you can have the death penalty in time of war. And that technically means a declared war. And I also discovered that in some countries, the UK, the US, in order for certain types of treason to be prosecuted, you need a proper declaration of war. It is not enough that you say we're at a war with terrorism or we're in an armed conflict with a certain group, you need a technically a declaration of war in order to prosecute somebody and convict them for the a crime of treason. And a third group of uh, issues that I can come back to later, it relates to naval warfare and in particular blockade and the seizure of enemy goods uh, on neutral ships or with regards to enemy ships. And I think for many uh, manuals and many states, in order to trigger those kinds of rights in law, you would need to have a, a proper declared war. Now, that's a very ambiguous area, but I, I highlight it as an area that I, I spent a lot of time in the book trying to dig down on. And I'm really suggesting that for these types of rights, you really need war with a capital W a formal declaration of war recognized as such in, in international 
law. And that's how I use the word war with a big W throughout the book as a formal declared war. Turning to the, um, the second uh, trope, uh, which I've spent a bit of time on in the, the chapter, that is the idea that there's somehow a license to kill uh, in time of war and that soldiers killing other soldiers have a license to kill. And I have suggested that that actually is false, that there's no such thing as a license to kill. It's a, a myth, um, maybe reinforced by the James Bond books and films, but even under British law today, um, secret agents do not have uh, the right to commit murder or human rights violations abroad. Um, so I've really tried to drill down and suggest that we forget this idea that war brings with it a license to kill. And stepping outside of the legal framework for a moment in political science and in particular in moral philosophy, the, the just war theorists talk about something they call a war convention. And according to the Michael Waltzer, a contemporary just war theorist, he says, there is a license for soldiers without regard to which side they're on. It is the first and most important of their war rights. They are entitled to kill. And as I say, this often gets shortened to the idea of a license to kill. And, and that may be an idea in moral philosophy, but I'm suggesting that in the modern world, and especially a world where everybody accepts that the right to life exists as a human right, it makes no sense anymore to consider that there is such a thing as a license to kill. There might be circumstances in which a life is taken, which is not a violation of human rights, but that is to sort of nuance the situation. And I'm really against the idea that you find in a lot of law of war books where they say, you know, you are entitled to shoot a sleeping soldier. Um, and I'm suggesting that such a killing is not necessary and therefore is not authorized by the laws of war and in fact will be a violation of human rights law and indeed the national law that applies. Um, so I'd like to put to bed the idea that there is such a thing as the license to kill in wartime. I think we have to really question that these days. Um, the third uh, trope, which I tried to question is the idea that if something is in conformity with the laws of war or humanitarian law, then it's necessarily a legitimate and uh, acceptable act. And I've rather pointed out that a, a killing of one soldier by another soldier might not look like a violation of the laws of war. It might be in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, but that doesn't mean that it's legal. It could be that it's in violation of the UN Charter because there's no right to self-defense involved or the Security Council has not gotten involved. And therefore we should consider those acts as illegal under international law and not somehow authorized, permitted or sanctioned by the laws of war. So I'm really suggesting that for each killing there should be two tests. Is it acceptable under the Geneva Conventions and the laws of war understood traditionally, but also is it acceptable as a matter of the UN Charter? And that demand continues throughout the course of the armed conflict. It's not just something that you take into account on the first day. So for me, self-defense has to be necessary throughout the course of the war and not just as a, a green light to go to war. And that again is, is probably not the traditional approach that many people have. Uh, fourthly, I would um, like to suggest that there's no such thing really as a right to retaliation. Uh, states often suggest, well, if we've been attacked, we have a right to retaliate. And, and it's a sort of popular idea that um, this is an act of war and therefore we will give as good as we've got and we will retaliate in kind. And the section in the book on proportionality says, proportionality is not about what has happened to you, that you can cause as much damage as you have suffered. Proportionality is a forward looking idea that says you can use as much force as is necessary to prevent the next round of attacks. It's nothing to do with what has happened to you. I mean, that will give you the context as to what is reasonable, but the fact that you've had 2,000 soldiers killed does not entitle you to go and kill 2,000 soldiers on the other side. And, and it's really to question the way in which we tend to instinctively think about um, proportionality. 
and this idea of an eye for an eye and, and retaliation. I'm really suggesting the modern law of war does not allow for that. And then lastly um, is the fifth idea, which is admits that under the ancient law of war, a state is entitled to capture, condemn, or permanently confiscate civilian enemy goods on enemy ships on the high seas, or even aeroplanes and in the latest manuals, even spaceships. And I've suggested that that's really not appropriate for the modern world. This idea that you capture as prize things belonging to civilians that happen to be on a flagged enemy ship and belonging to an enemy national. It makes no sense because if, if uh, a state has gone to war illegally in violation of the UN Charter, why would we allow that state to seize things that don't belong to them? Um, and I use this metaphor, which is probably not appropriate, but I'll use it again. I mean, we don't say in national law that if a burglar breaks into your house illegally, they can keep everything that they find there or that you as the homeowner because you're in a conflict now with them, they can, you can go to the burglar's house and seize all the things that you find there, not just your own things, but everything that belongs to the other side. And to me, these, these old rules make no sense. If we have abolished war, it makes no sense that you get a belligerent right when you go to war um, and you get to keep things that you can find on the other side, whether they belong to the state or, or civilians. It seems a very 19th century idea for the 21st century. Um, so I think war as an institution can no longer give rise to this idea that you take things and that idea can no longer operate. Um, war can no longer justify taking prize and claiming that there's a so-called belligerent right. And I'm really suggesting at the end of the book, we should abolish the idea of war booty, that it's no longer a valid rule and that being at war does not entitle you, in fact, to do anything anymore. We have in the end, abolished war. So those would be my opening thoughts. Uh, I hope that gives us plenty to discuss and I'm very ready now to take questions from the panel or anybody who's online and I pass the floor back to you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Professor Clapham, for your introductory observations. Uh, it, it, it is now my pleasure to invite my esteemed colleague Professor Norman Schwazo. Prof professor Norman is a professor at the Department of History and Philosophy, North Southern University. Norman, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Rizwan. You can hear me all right. I have an unstable internet, it looks like. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So let me begin formally. Appropriate to his intent in, with this book, uh, Professor Clapham distinguishes between armed conflicts in general and situations that can be considered as constituting a state of war under international law. The distinction is important in light of post-World War II discourse in terms in which the term war, capital W, has been used less, and instead we find in use the more legally ambiguous but politically convenient concept of armed conflict or a collective security operation or a UN authorized peace operation or an exceptional humanitarian intervention or a counter-terrorism intervention, et cetera, et cetera. All of which terms in use relate to the fact that as Professor Clapham reminds, war as an institution has been outlawed, even abolished under international law. We are well aware also, of course, of the metaphorical uses of the term war, small w, in expressions such as war on poverty, war on drugs, trade war, war on terror, war on pandemic viruses, cyber warfare, etc. Likewise important is Professor Clapham's concern for uses of the terms war, small w, and war, capital W, which represent both a statement of fact and a statement of mind, a state of mind for those engaged in such discourse each with pertinent sets of consequences that need to be assessed, including legal consequences having to do with the articulation of rights and obligations and sundry means for settlement of disputes. Thus, Professor Clapton rightly reminds that the meaning of war will depend on the context, and each context brings with it different policy implications for finding that there is a war on. It is more or less standard, for example, that one speaks of World War I and World War II, capital W for each, but one speaks ambiguously when one says the Korean conflict, the Vietnam conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, 
when there is a question of whether an official or formal declaration of war was issued by the relevant authority. For example, in the USA by the Congress or by the state of Israel in relation to Arab states and the stateless Palestinians, later represented by either the non-state Palestinian authority or Hamas. The same ambiguity is present in what has been referred to as Gulf War I and Gulf War II, the latter in particular constituting a coalition of the willing and the legal justification of which has since been challenged on many grounds, factual, moral, and legal. Under international law, on one reading at least, an act of war, capital W, is understood to mean the use of force or other action by one state against another, emphasis on the word state here, and in which either a formal declaration of war or a manifest retaliation against the aggressor state occurs. Yet with the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York on 9-11, Professor Clapton informs us, these attacks were construed to be acts of war, capital W. In the plain meaning of the term, even though these attacks were not carried out by a state or a governmental entity per se. Thus the language concerning war, war, capital W, small w continues to have its ambiguity. The events of 9-11 began the so-called global war on terror and identification of Al-Qaeda and global jihadists, including the Taliban, as terrorist organizations against whom war, capital W, was justifiably to be prosecuted by the USA and its coalition partners. Thus, to engage the discourse about war, small w, and war, capital W, is also to make an important distinction between de facto government enti governing entities, such as the Taliban, who spoke of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and de jure governments or states, for example, the USA and the UK, either of which use either of which use and denotation will contextualize the identification and assessment of legal consequences in Clapton's sense of assertion of rights and obligations. Professor Clapton rightly draws our attention to the problematic language where legality enters the scene of interpretation as to what is characterized factually as manifest violence, hostilities, and armed conflict, and what legally counts as resort to war, capital W, and even theologically a just war, capital W, that meets the criteria of justification, including here lawful authority, lawful combatants, a lawful objective, a just cause, right intention, and proportionality of military engagement. So are we yet to use the religious theological language of the just war tradition or the language of a use gentium or law of nations with attention to the legal implications of privileging the modern principle of state sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, as Professor Clapham appreciates, in our day and time, it is not so customary among politicians and public officials to speak in terms of just and unjust war. Even as a philosopher such as Jürgen Habermas opines that we no longer have just or unjust wars, only legal or illegal ones, depending on whether they are justified or unjustified under international law. But of course, with that statement, one is faced with the central questions at issue. How does international law speak to what today counts as war, capital W, and what criteria determine whether such a war is justified or unjustified legally? What body of law applies here? Are we to speak of a declaratory tradition, a natural law tradition, 20th century realism, law in relation to ethical theories such as a global rationalism grounded in Immanuel Kant's deontological ethics, or in British utilitarianism, or 20th century contractarianism? or Western liberalism linked to conceptions of political economy, or classical Marxism, such as yet taught in the formal philosophical curriculum of Chinese universities. Are we to link war with capital W to the requirements of justice somehow or other represented only by a positivist conception of law in contrast to an international law that conceives of justice in some sense of international morality and ethics in international affairs? Either way, what do we expect to obtain thereby as a matter of the behavior of states and that of international intergovernmental institutions that largely defer to state sovereign authority and depend on the voluntary commitment of states to one or another concept of international law? These technical questions seem then less a matter for public officials to determine, for example, heads of state or legislative authorities such as the US Congress or the British Parliament, and more a problem for experts in international law who become civil servants for a time and have charge of the formulation of policies of national security, diplomacy, or national defense. 
Hence the need for an assessment of the international law of war, capital W, such as Professor Clapton undertakes in his book. Yet one wonders whether there can be any legitimate use of the concept war, capital W, if we say that international law has abolished war as a method for resolving disputes or as an instrument of national policy. Consider, for example, that neoconservative realists such as former US National Security Advisor John Bolton in the Trump administration deny the reality of international law and hence privilege the sovereign prerogatives of state, including the right to go to war with claims of American exceptionalism to so-called international law. While Professor Clapton holds out hope for the disappearance of the concept of war from encyclopedias and dictionaries of international law, I for one think it important and essential to relate a concept of law to a concept of war, capital W, and that both concepts must necessarily reference some concept of justice. Under functionalist political theory of international organizations such as that advanced by David Mitterne in the mid 20th century, the UN and its specialized agencies were to constitute a working peace system. Yet geopolitical realists have continued to press their sovereign prerogatives contrary to demands for a just world order. Professor Clapton appeals to the legitimacy of both the rules of jus ad bellum, the right to go to war, and the rules of jus in bello, the right conduct of war, otherwise known by the acronym LOAC, the Law of Armed Conflict, or IHL, International Humanitarian Law, but also what has been called the use post bellum, what justice requires in the post-war phase, even if what he calls a paradigm shift. I concur, given that we must challenge geopolitical realpolitik and strengthen international law in the interest of global security and world order. But as Professor Alastair McIntyre reminds us, we are always in the position of having to ask whose justice, which rationality, that is whose concept of justice is to apply and which rational framework is to apply, given that rival concepts are in use and there remains unsettled contention in the discourses that are engaged. To conclude, in short, there is much conceptual work to be done with all such questions. And Professor Clapton is entirely correct to engage the topic on which he has written informatively and insightfully in this book. We have much to gain from engaging with what Professor Clapton brings to the forefront of discussion in an effort to minimize ambiguity and achieve some clarity about these important matters. As technology changes the temporal and spatial scope of the battlefield and who may be targeted, killed or detained or what may be targeted and destroyed despite so-called precision, smart precision targeting and foreseen but presumably, uh, excuse me, uh, presumably unintended collateral damage it matters all the more that we are clear as best we can be about the, about the distinction of war, capital W, and peace. Given that there are yet among us those who appeal to the principle of necessity and even the legitimacy of a supreme emergency exemption, we are yet bound to hope to restrain and constrain the human, all too human hubris of contemporary power politics that manifests itself in war, capital W. Thank you, Professor Clapton, for your very interesting book. Thank you, Norm, for your observations. It is now my pleasure to invite another esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Ishrat Jakia Sultana. She is also a member of our Center for Peace Studies and an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science and Sociology. So, Dr. Sultana, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, depending upon where you're joining from. Am I audible to you? Yes, Dr. I will Okay, thank you. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to say a few words about this book, War, written by Andrew Clapham, Professor of International Law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. At the same time, Although I'm quite interested in knowing the background and context of policies and laws that are defined and influenced by our concepts and perceptions, it is not an easy task for me to talk about this book, maybe because of my limited knowledge in law as I'm a student and the faculty of sociology. And also it is not an easy task to talk about this book after Professor Norman Swazi. Anyway, I'll try with my limited capacity uh, to do justice to the job assigned on me. Uh, 
So first of all, I like the introductory chapter the most that very nicely sets the tone of the book. One of the statements from this chapter seems quite powerful to me that says, the meaning of war is not dependent on whether there was a declared war or whether the executive considered there was a war. To explain this quote, Professor Clapham used the example of hostilities and fighting between Japan and Korea in 1937. The English court didn't want to call it a war, rather happily extended the meaning of war risks in contrast to cover situations such as the Spanish Civil War. But a change in discourse is noticeable. Uh, Professor Norman Sauzi addressed this very well, so I'll not go into details. So the change in discourse uh, is noticeable, particularly in history and law, where the use of the word war isn't much used these days. In fact, the author rightly mentions that today the term war is out of fashion. And a lot of books on armed conflict and violent actions or international humanitarian laws tend to avoid the word war. To me, it is some sort of approval that war is not expected or uh, not wanted, wherever it is and whichever form it is in. However, according to the author, the notion of war is at the center in politics, ethics, philosophy, and law. No doubt about that. And it is evident in his skillful presentation of legal background, the context, the historical settings of war in his book. While the book sheds light on the meaning of war, it demonstrates the role and limitations of the international laws in this regard. We can clearly understand how the meaning of war to both Obama and Trump was different than that of the stateless people. For the former two, war was something about gaining and showing uh, and, and probably enjoying power more and more. Uh, for the refugees, stateless people, vulnerable people, who escape war and armed conflict just to survive. War is what generates fear, causes violence, multiplies helplessness, and makes life uncertain. So should we assume that the great politicians like those I mentioned a few moments ago are unaware of what war means to the stateless and vulnerable people? We all know the answer, and that is no. One of the main arguments that the author makes in his book is war as the legal institution has been abolished and the time has come that the states that used the belligerent rights, an interesting legal term, during the war no longer do that. While I agree with this claim, I, it raises question that the role the states play today without waging or declaring a war in persecuting and violating human rights, how do we accept that from both legal and human, human rights perspectives? And this book kind of answers this question. It says, it is an inability to choose peaceful over violent ways of resolving uh, disputes. Another idea that seems quite rational and pragmatic is when the author says that the reason why there are always war is because you can never completely share the sufferings of others. I'm surprised to see how it fits the situation of the Rohingya people in Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar didn't officially formally uh, wage war against the Rohingya, but can genocide be underestimated and ignored because it didn't happen during the war? Lawyer Ranfil Lemkin separated genocide from war, saying that war is conducted against states and armed forces and not against populations. Professor Clapham also clarified this very nicely in his book. But no international law, if that is established on sense of ethics and morality, can ignore the severity of genocide happened against the Rohingya. But I wonder if this book anyway could drill down a little bit on the international laws on or about committing genocides without declaring a war against the state, but declaring war against the non-Buddhist nationalism that we all know happened in Myanmar. My apologies if I have deviated from the focus of the book, but it is difficult for me to avoid bringing sociological perspectives and talking about an issue like war. I certainly recommend this book to those who are interested in knowing about law and war 
um, and how the concepts and ideas about war shape our perceptions of rights and responsibilities and obligations outlined in, uh, in many different national and international laws. I end with a quote from Ibn Khaldun who said that man is the child of customs, so not the child of his ancestors. I think the nature of corruption, social solidarity, sympathy, empathy, ethical degradation, and all these are part of customs somehow, which may not always be explained by laws, and that sometimes force people to wage war and to be peaceful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultana, for your excellent observations. I'm sure Professor Clapton would like to respond to some of the observations and maybe he would also like to make some more observations about the book and also raise other issues. So I would of course invite Professor Clapton to do that. And I also encourage our attendees to please raise their virtual hands if they feel that their questions or observations would be a bit too long. Or if they feel that the questions are short, they may use the chat box and I would read them out to the uh, author. So Professor Clapham, if you would like to make some observations in the light of the comments and observations by the two discussants. Well, uh, thank you very much to both of you for a fantastic set of comments. I'm so pleased that you've actually highlighted that the lawyers shouldn't get to dominate the discussion around this topic because it's too narrow and we need to question whether or not the rules that are being proposed really do fit with justice and morality. So I'm very pleased that it's been suggested, you know, that the end of this story is not just to work out which legal principles apply, but which principles of justice and morality ought to apply. And I've, I've tried to do that in the book a little, but you've sort of pushed the question of it further down the line. And I really would like to suggest that everybody um, listening and people thinking about this try to work out what is appropriate um, in terms of how we behave in times of tension and conflict, and that we get away from the idea that once a war has started, then one can do whatever is necessary to win the war. My suggestion is that one should only be able to do what is necessary to protect oneself from the violence, and that's not quite the same set of questions. So I was very pleased that you picked up the Habermas uh, quote in the book where, you know, he, he goes down the route of least resistance of saying, well, whether a war is justified or not is whether it's legal or not. And uh, I'd be the first to question whether that should be the end of the story, because I could easily imagine a, an armed conflict which was authorised by the Security Council, but maybe we disagree with the majority of the Security Council. Maybe we shouldn't be authorising uh, such a use of force in, the, in that context. And I'd like to open up those questions. And to the sort of second set of questions um, about genocide and where does this fit and, and shouldn't we be more focused on that? I think you're absolutely right. Um, and if I'd had a little more time in the, or if I'd thought to mention it at the beginning, the example I could have given of when the laws of war are not enough, in other words, one soldier killing another soldier seems to be legal. But if that killing is done with genocidal intent, the fact that it's legal under the laws of war does not make it correct or legal generally. And so I think uh, bringing in the genocide question, even within an armed conflict, obviously also outside of armed conflict, is important because it, it forces us to add a, a second set of questions as to whether a particular attack or a particular killing um, should be considered legal or morally acceptable. And so um, thank you for pulling me up on that. And of course, I'm, I'm aware of the, the situation with Myanmar and the Rohingya. And those actions can be in some ways worse in terms of the scope of them than what happens in a small scale armed conflict. And so we shouldn't see sort of war as somehow the sort of ultimate and worst thing and then everything else is below that. Genocide or crimes against humanity or human rights violations can be worse 
um, obviously my focus was on understanding what happens when the word war gets used. But you're right, it can even be used to sort of cover up a genocide and say, well, we are at war with armed elements with the Rohingya, and therefore the killing is justified as our belligerent rights. And I'm really asking us, yes, indeed, um, to question that. So thank you both for great comments and for sort of steering the discussion in a way into a much broader palette of questions than what constitutes war as a matter of law. Thank you so much. I can see the virtual hands of Mr. Kazi Omar Faisal. So please uh, raise your questions, Faisal. Okay, as they do so, let me just ask a question to our Thank author. Thank you, uh, I'm uh, unable to unmute finally. Uh, great, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Professor Clapham, for your fantastic lecture. It's always a pleasant to hear you. By the way, I was your student at Geneva Academy 2017 class. Uh, I have two questions, uh, one for clarification, another question. The first question is about, you mentioned about the declaration of war for certain purposes. Is it only for IAC or it is also for the NIAC? And second question is about the impact of international criminal law, especially the extension of war crimes into uh, NIAC after Tadi's case and recent inclusion of crime of aggression. So did it uh, change the discourse of war, international law, international politics? Thank you. Thank you, Farsal. Thank you. Um, well, just on this last question, uh, the creation of war crimes law and the creation of the crime of aggression at the International Criminal Court, um, has it changed the discourse? I think it, it sort of has. And I'd like to refer back to the, the points made by Professor Suazo at the beginning. You know, he quite rightly pointed out that for a, a realist like John Bolton, you know, international law is, is just promises made by states, but it's not binding. And it's just something that a state might or might not wish to abide by as a matter of its diplomacy. And my answer would be, well, with the creation of the international courts, um, you can't really talk like that in a convincing way anymore, because it is possible that somebody can be arrested and taken to The Hague and put in prison for violating international law, whether it's war crimes law or the crime of aggression. Now, of course, you know, from an American foreign policy perspective, they would just say, but that's ridiculous. No one will ever take an American diplomat to The Hague. You know, he's just talking nonsense, this Professor Clapham. But um, it's theoretically possible. And, you know, one never knows. I mean, it's uh, quite feasible that an American, I don't know, it doesn't have to be John Bolton, but a service personnel working in Afghanistan or Iraq um, is arrested for one reason or another and surrendered to The Hague and put on trial for war crimes, uh, we're leaving aggression aside for the moment. Um, and I've always been surprised that the Americans sort of suggest that this is just not a, a real possibility, that it's just made up, it's not real law. I mean, the Hague Court exists and they have a real cell where people could be put and there's real possibility that someone would be transferred to be prosecuted, and um, sorry, punished and, and spend time in jail. So I think uh, the Tadic idea, which sort of concretized that war crimes could be committed in a non-international armed conflict. And the fact of the International Criminal Court does change the discourse. And I was asked to write some critical comments on the American Law of War manual. And one of my points was the manual is very misleading for American soldiers because it says there's an International Criminal Court that can prosecute war crimes, but America doesn't agree with the International Criminal Court. And so we'll move to another chapter. But the soldier needs to know that they could be arrested and prosecuted for committing a war crime. It's not enough to say we just don't agree with it or we don't believe in it. From my perspective, it, it exists. Um, with regards to your first question uh, about a declaration of war and does this only affect interstate armed conflict? I mean, I think the short answer is yes. But a complete answer would say that if a state chooses to declare war 
and recognize the belligerency of the rebels it is fighting against, then that declaration converts that civil war, if you like, into a declared war with a capital W with all the rights and obligations that are, some people think traditionally apply. And that, of course, as I tried to explain in the book, is exactly what happened with the American Civil War, that President Lincoln, um, by blockading the southern ports, essentially declared war on the south and converted that civil war into a war between two entities that international law recognizes as having the full rights of statehood in time of war and it affects British neutrality rights and all the rest of it. So the longer answer is that a declaration of war, if it's accompanied with a declaration of belligerency, could be significant legally and convert a, a civil war into a big war with a capital W. It comes up from time to time, more than just in academic textbooks, that there have been speculations in Latin America about converting some of those armed conflicts into belligerent war um, in the context of Colombia and other states. There's some references to that in the book. So it, it's an important question and it, it comes up from time to time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clapham. Now, I think so far we have talked about the public law aspects of war mostly. So I was wondering, and particularly, I think I have read a few cases on your book that how the precise moment of declaration of war or a non-declaration, but a de facto armed conflict, how that had impact on private rights about insurance and other things. So if you could say a few words about that, that how the laws on war can have impact on private law. Yes. Well, um, as uh, Dr. Sultana suggested, uh, the judges will look at the context. And so if you look in your next time you travel, if you look in the small print on the back of the ticket or on your insurance, you'll see that there are all kinds of exceptions uh, if you travel through a war zone or if you war breaks out. But the insurance company... Uh, and you are presumed to know what is meant by war in that context. And so it's a difficult question to answer because these days, um, for example, I had to travel to Iraq in 2003. You mentioned it uh, in introducing me. And I noticed that the insurance offered by my university said that I would not be covered in a war zone. Well, of course, if I had said with my lawyer's hat on, oh, well, there's no declaration of war against Iraq in 2003, it's a UN security operation. The insurance company would have said, no, it looks pretty much like a war to us. People are dying and bombs are going off and you're not covered. So it's, it's very contextual. I think if you were to travel uh, today to uh, parts of Ethiopia, or you had a contract under English law, which said, if the goods, are not delivered on time, there will be a penalty, unless it's because of a war. Um, you might find that the context suggests that in Ethiopia, in the Tigray region, the insurance company could convince a judge that that is a result of war. So the, the old understanding in the 19th century that it's a war when it's been declared and everybody knows it's a war is not going to be relevant in private law situations when it comes to delivery of goods when it comes to insurance it's very contextual and it depends on what is assumed to be understood by the parties so the case which dr sultana mentioned um, related to the fact that everybody thought that a war was about to break out and therefore the context was clear so if you imagined a contract that you, um, Professor Islam, enter into with, uh, I don't know, a, a Swiss company to um, have some Swiss watches delivered to you in Bangladesh. And the contract says, uh, these will be delivered on this day unless war breaks out between Russia and Ukraine. 
that's probably a reference to the Russians invading Ukraine, whether or not they declare a war. And so it's what's on everybody's mind at the time. Whereas if you'd had the same contract 200 years ago, they probably would have expected a declaration of war and a mini invasion, if I can put it like that, might not have qualified to annul your contract. So it's a really difficult question to answer. It really depends on the context and what's going on at the time and what people really understand by this very ambiguous word. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much. I can see the virtual hands of Ambassador Shahidul Haq being raised. So Professor uh, Clapham, and the next question would be from Ambassador Haq. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Clapham, for uh, uh, a very good presentation followed by two very uh, distinguished uh, discussions. Uh, since you um, sort of uh, uh, raised the issue of Ukraine, I thought uh, uh, let's uh, draw you into, into that debate. Uh, my basic um, sort of a, a query is that how do you explain the current situation within the broader frame of your book of the Ukraine, uh, number one? Uh, number two is... Um, uh, you know, the, uh, there are two schools or three schools of thought. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the NATO and American things that, uh, in fact, uh, Russia has already invaded, waged a war by occupying um, uh, a part of, uh, a part of um, Ukraine, if not the Crimea. Uh, so, so there's already their soldiers stationed there. So do you think that it's... Uh, it's tantamount to declaring war, number one. Number two, uh, so we'll see how, how it goes. And the Russians are saying that, you know, no, it's, uh, it's their uh, legitimate right to uh, secure uh, their border from a possible uh, encroachment by the NATO. So that's one. The second question is very interesting that I was reading this morning of The Economist. Uh, I'm sure that... Possibly, I don't know whether you had a chance to look at it. Uh, you know, the Professor Noah Harari was asked to write about Ukraine. And, and I think it's a very interesting piece that he, he, he is, he's always interesting. He's a philosopher and a historian. He argues that uh, what uh, is at stake in Ukraine uh, is the direction of human history. And they said, you know, human uh, basically prone to uh, struggle, conflict, and war. So what will happen uh, would depend primarily on, uh, on how humanity behaves. And uh, he thinks that there may be a reputation, although he hasn't directly said that there will be a war. He said, it is just the reputation of history because we don't learn from the history. So, you know, if you link this one and my first one, how do you see? Do you think that the war is inevitable or it has already begun? Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a set of very, very difficult questions, but very pertinent, as you've implied. And um, I haven't seen the piece. It's on my list of things to read, the piece in The Economist, so I, I won't be able to address that directly. But let me try and address the situation in Ukraine and, and what the book says about that. I think um, the first thing that I've noticed and I would highlight in the context of our discussion today is that Russia is still looking for legal arguments as to why she might be entitled to enter Ukraine. And certainly the British and the Americans have been pointing to the possibility that Russia would, is waiting to present a situation where it looks as though Russia has been attacked in order to justify going in. And I think what is interesting in the context of the book is that Russia is not saying we're entitled to go in because we're entitled to declare war or we're entitled to go into Ukraine because our sphere of interest influence is threatened. They still uh, would say that the UN Charter has to be respected. And so if they were to invade, it seems at the moment that they would argue that they had been attacked. There could be an attack on an embassy or on some Russian soldiers. Um, but it's not that there is 
a so-called right to go to war. Nobody on the Russian side has suggested that. And I think that's interesting. Um, in the past, uh, a dispute between states, uh, a great power would say, well, we're going to declare war and, and that will be how we resolve this dispute. And, and that discussion is not happening. So the idea that there is a right to go to war is not on the table. So that's important. Now you asked whether Russia is maybe already um, in an armed conflict situation with Ukraine um, through the occupation of Crimea and the presence in Eastern Donbas or Eastern Ukraine. And I think um, from an international law perspective, yes, one would say that Crimea is occupied territory. It is not uh, part of Russia. It's not seen that way by international humanitarian law lawyers. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is um, an ongoing war as such uh, with hostilities, but it does mean that the laws of war apply to what happens in Crimea and the Russian presence there. And the Fourth Geneva Convention would apply to that area and protect the people there as the victims of war. Um, so the fact that Russia is there does not necessarily mean that it's not significant were there to be a further invasion um, of Ukraine. That would constitute a new aggression, uh, in my view. It's not a continuation of the previous uh, occupation. So these are sort of starts to get a bit technical, but I think it's extremely significant if Russia were to invade, because precisely as you say, um, this seems to be to be going backwards. The idea that a massive army invades another state because it's unhappy with the political situation, with, with its thoughts about joining NATO, is not uh, either as a moral question, a just war scenario, or certainly not as a legal question, would entitle you to invade. But I would suggest that the interesting thing to watch is the arguments which are made by Russia about why she might eventually be entitled to use force. And so far, they do not suggest some vague idea of a right to go to war, but more the fact that Russia would feel that she had been attacked and that would fit within the traditional paradigm. But really, really difficult set of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hawk, for the question. And of course, Professor Clapham for the answer. Another attendee. Ms. Purnima Vizaya, she is asking, how does a conflict between armed groups, in this case of rebels, translate into legitimacy? That's a, an extremely good question. Um, I think if, a, if I was a moral philosopher or a just war theorist, um, I would have trouble with that, but I would probably gravitate to the idea that if one group is being oppressed by the other group, that there is some sort of right to engage in conflict to vindicate your rights. Now, as an international lawyer, and also I think from my own moral stance, I don't really believe that there's a right to resort to violence to, to vindicate your rights. I think that's an old just war idea. And as Professor Suazo, you know, suggested to us at the beginning, I mean, wh whose idea of justice are we really following? Um, my idea would be that you're not entitled to resort to violence, even if um, you feel oppressed by the other group. Um, and that uh, there has to be a peaceful way to resolve that. So do I, I suppose my short answer is I'm not sure it really does translate into legitimacy. I'm not sure that we really recognize the right of one group to use violence against another group. I think from a legal perspective, the only legitimacy that one can really talk about is the legitimacy of the government using violence to protect its citizens who are being subjected to violence. So if another army is invading, then the state will be entitled to use violence to repel that invasion. And if a state is faced with an armed group attacking it and its citizens, it can use violence to protect those people under attack. Ultimately, there may be some sort of uh, legitimacy in an armed group taking up arms against a state, but 
those are very exceptional situations where a state is engaged as a racist regime or in, in a situation of occup alien occupation and, and that gets into some very, very exceptional situations. But I think in general, I don't feel that conflict between armed groups really does translate into legitimacy. I think conflict between armed groups is, is violence and is illegitimate. Thank you, Professor Clement, for that answer. Now, I think we haven't discussed another form of sort of, if not direct violence, but can be as literal as direct violence, the cyber attack, the cyber warfare, so to borrow the parlance of many. So how do you think the traditional rules on the use of force could apply to this new phenomenon? Any observations on that, please? Yes, no, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, I think one has to be careful, as I've suggested all along, that just because somebody calls a cyber attack cyber warfare, that doesn't mean that you're entitled to engage in real warfare in return using violence and killing people, if I can put it like that. It is possible that a cyber attack does result in loss of life and therefore a proportionate response to prevent further attacks may indeed involve violence. But I think one has to be careful about talking in the abstract of suggesting that cyber warfare entitles you to engage in kinetic warfare, to use the technical term. So if I give a concrete example, if the cyber attack means that airplanes are falling out of the sky and collapsing and killing people, clearly that's the equivalent of a missile attack on those airplanes. And one might be entitled to use force against those people who were controlling the computers that was leading to that. But if the cyber attack involves loss of personal data or a fall on the stock exchange, that doesn't, in my view, entitle you to respond with armed violence involving the loss of life. So I think one has to sort of break down what do we mean by a cyber attack? And I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Clapham. I can see the virtual hands of Ambassador yeah, Hopkins once if again. No, so if nobody is asking and you have many, I, I just want uh, your, your, uh, your analysis on a particular uh, situation. I think I'm going to draw from uh, 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 Dr. Sultana on the Rohingya issue. Now, uh, in 2017 and 18, there was uh, 2017, in fact, August, September, uh, there was a situation in uh, in the border between Bangladesh and Myanmar, where uh, uh, some policymakers thought this is a warlike situation. To the extent one of the senior ministers suggested that sending uh, so many Rohingyas across uh, the border in large number is actually tantamount to invasion or attack on the on the state of Bangladesh. Now. Maybe this, this is too much, but but that was also, uh, you know, then subsequently the uh, year invasion uh, by the Myanmar uh, attack helicopters and the foot soldiers uh, created a situation where uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, did certainly talked about uh, a, a possible war. And in that situation, what would be uh, uh, the response uh, from Bangladesh? Uh, but then uh, sanity prevailed and, uh, and our prime minister decided no provocation should uh, uh, lead us uh, to retaliate uh, because at least two of the helicopters were 10 kilometers inside and we had uh, a sort of equipment stationed there which could have brought it down. And that could have been the beginning of a war which Myanmar wanted at that time so that it can divert from the whole, whole issue. Now. What is your analysis on, of such a situation? Is there a similar parallel that you can draw from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from your experience and on the whole issue of cyber attack? So the Malaysian uh, plane, which was brought down in Central Asia, was actually uh, a situation where Malaysia could have launched a war against uh, people who are doing it from the ground. Am I correct in, in saying it? If they had the capacity. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, you're asking an excellent question and I'll try and um, answer. I think one has to be careful. It's possible that uh, you have a 
airplanes or helicopters invading your airspace and your territorial sovereignty, as you say. And that is a violation of international law, but it's not necessarily considered to be an armed attack on the state um, where the territory has been infringed. And therefore the right to engage in armed force in response, the right of self-defense is not necessarily triggered. So this is a sort of confusing area because obviously you ask me for parallels. It happens all the time with regards to Syria now with different militaries passing through Syria without permission. And the question arises, is Syria really being attacked? Or if those Turkish airplanes or British or French or American are actually attacking ISIS or Al Qaeda on the ground, is that an attack on Syria entitling Syria to respond or is it something different? And I think lawyers and, and policymakers are very um, divided on this and it's, it's not at all obvious. So to answer your question, I think, as you rather suggested, Bangladesh was very wise not to consider that Bangladesh had come under attack and was obliged to respond to Myanmar. Um, that doesn't mean that Myanmar didn't violate the law and that you couldn't complain and ask for non-repetition and damages and all the rest of it. So I think um, it's important to distinguish what looks like a massive inflow of people from something which is an armed attack and it's not necessarily the same thing and if you ask for another parallel of course the way in which um belarus is encouraging migrant uh, asylum seekers to enter poland it's not of course on the same scale or for the same reasons uh, as myanmar bangladesh but people do quickly jump to the idea, well, this is a hybrid warfare. I saw it again today in the papers and belligerent acts, uh, which sort of ups the rhetoric and sort of starts to suggest to people that one needs to think about a military response. And I would suggest that's all rather unfortunate. The only time you should be responding militarily is if you are under a real armed attack and not an influx of people or somebody violating your sovereignty. So thank you for the question. And I think it's, it's really important to try and keep those ideas separate because otherwise you, you escalate the violence and that's not really in anybody's interest um, unless it's absolutely necessary. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Clapham. Uh, I would like to ask, I think in your book, you have discussed this, that in countries like Germany, Italy, Japan, it is extremely, uh, difficult to engage in a war. They, they sort of have constitutional provisions, constitutional restraints. So I was wondering, does the experience of the Second World War somehow have shaped that law? And if it has, how the same, in same sort of situations, what about the main leading uh, powers on the other side, on the uh, allied forces. How is their national law and has that national law in any way impacted their subsequent practice on the use of force? I know it's a very broad question, but- it Yes, no, it, it's an thoughts. excellent question. Thank you. Um, and as you say, it's broad, but I will actually answer it with some quite specific examples uh, in, in not too much detail, but uh, I haven't detailed it all in the book, but the situation of Japan is very interesting because Japan, as you said, at the end of the Second World War in its constitution has all kinds of guarantees not to go to war again. But Japan wants to play a role in international relations and particularly in international peacekeeping. And it has the capacity to send soldiers and equipment abroad and, and to carry out humanitarian missions. And so the national law is constantly being revised to allow for Japanese peacekeepers to engage in sort of limited use of force to, for example, rescue Japanese humanitarian workers abroad um, who are in warlike situations, but who need to be extracted by the Japanese military. And so the Japanese public is very sensitive about the Japanese military engaging in the use of force abroad, but at the same time, they want to develop an exception which would allow for them uh, 
to help Japanese humanitarian workers who need to be evacuated. And the problem has arisen in quite concrete terms of, well, if you allow the Japanese army to extract Japanese humanitarian workers, probably in any one peacekeeping situation, the Japanese humanitarian workers will be mixed in with Dutch or Bangladeshi or Nepalese humanitarian workers. And does that mean the Japanese Air Force just leaves behind the non-Japanese? That doesn't look very humanitarian either. And so they've had to adjust the law again to say, well, if we are rescuing people, it doesn't matter their nationality, um, because if they're humanitarian workers working with the Japanese, we should rescue everyone. So you can see that little by little, the national law has to change to adapt to the practical situation. And little by little, you get closer to something that starts to look like a war situation. So it's very delicate. And, and there are similar situations um, for Italy uh, wanting, obviously they have a member of NATO and they have NATO bases. And so questions of overflight and not being involved in somebody else's war have to be nuanced. Um, and similarly for Germany in Afghanistan, uh, Germany has played quite a big role and now there are cases before the German courts questioning decisions um, which were taken to bomb uh, Taliban connected uh, installations at the time and saying, well, this is starting to look much more like war than nation building or peacekeeping. But of course, from the German commander on the ground, it's maybe necessary in their eyes to protect German troops from a future attack. So the, the line between what is war, what is self-defense, what is humanitarian, what is rescuing nationals abroad, these are, are very flexible and they depend a bit on how comfortable the people are with their soldiers or sailors or airmen acting abroad. <clears throat> and that is something that can change over time. It's not necessarily determined by a fixed understanding of what war means. But as you rightly suggest in your question, it, it's particularly interesting to look at what happens in, in Germany, Italy and, and Japan, just to take those three cases. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are almost running out of time. So this has to be last question. Another question from Purnima Vizaya. Words are claimed to have just causes as mentioned by you. So how does this justify the unjust consequences of the sin? Is it not shallow to call it collateral damages? Uh, thank you. That's a, a great question to end on. And it sort of highlights what I was trying to say at the beginning, that I think we shouldn't allow the idea that just because you are at war, there will inevitably be collateral damage and therefore such deaths are justified. The book really suggests that every death has to be questioned as to whether it has happened in a just way and whether it can be justified. And so collateral damage is a, a term which sort of seeks to legitimize or justify what happened. But a lot of collateral damage can indeed be illegal. And civilians who are killed in a way which was disproportionate to the military advantage which the state was seeking to gain, or civilians who are killed in a war of aggression, even if their killing is apparently proportionate to the military advantage of the aggressor. In both cases, for me, those deaths are violations of their human rights. And in the first case could even be a war crime. And so I think when one sees somebody justifying deaths as collateral damage, my plea is to ask, it, you can call it collateral, but is it justified? And as the questioner suggests, um, that might lead us to an illegal situation or an immoral situation. And the point of the book is really to, to encourage people to ask those questions and not be satisfied with an explanation that this has been done in compliance with the laws of war as if that somehow makes it justifiable and morally acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clapton. Now, I would like to invite my esteemed colleague, Dr. Abdul Wahab, an assistant professor at the Department of 
political science and sociology, and also the current coordinator of the Center for Asian Studies. Dr. Rohab, the floor is yours. Thank you. We're, we are coming to the end, so I'm not going to be very long. Uh, and thank you, moderator, Professor uh, Rizwan Islam. Uh, and good evening uh, or good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are currently residing. On behalf of the Center for Peace Studies of South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, I feel really proud to be a part of such amazing discussion today. I also feel honored to meet the author of the book, especially Professor uh, Klapon, and uh, directly hearing from you uh, on your book. So it was really amazing to hear from you. This discussion uh, especially remind me my childhood back in 1991. You remember that when the Gulf War won, uh, according to uh, Suazo, I think there was a Gulf War II later on, broke out between the United States led coalition forces. You may call them the Western Alliance and the Iraqi forces with the issue of invasion quit by Saddam Hussein in 1990. Later, we have been experiencing ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, particularly Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. In Africa, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, Ethiopia, uh, also with other countries, Liberia, uh, Libya, uh, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and different parts in there, and also different parts of the world today. I personally refuse to call them war, the way whether it is a capital W or a small W. Rather, I would call them conflicts. It has also been covered wonderfully by Professor Clapham uh, and, and your book. In my opinion, this ongoing conflict is a kind of representation of power and knowledge, which has been reflected to the famous sociologist as you know that I'm coming from the sociology background, other than Habermas, Habermas, uh, Professor Klapon, you already mentioned in his book, uh, is another sociologist who is Edward Said, particularly with his idea of Orientalism. Let me talk a little bit about that. The central argument of Orientalism is that the way we acquire knowledge is not innocent. But interestingly, the end result of a process that reflects certain interests that is highly motivated. Especially Said argues that the way the West, particularly Europe and the US looks at the countries and people of the Middle East and different parts of the world is through a lens that distorts the actual reality of those places and those people. He also calls this lens through which we view that part of the world is Orientalism. Orientalism is a framework that we use to understand the unfamiliar and stress condition in our society. This condition, according to Sai, makes the peoples of the Middle East and other part of the world, except the West, appear different and threatening. Professor Sai's contribution to how we understand this general process of what we could call stereotyping has been immense. So as you all have understood by the discussion of Professor Klapun and also uh, Professor Norman and Dr. Ishad, that the condition we are currently going through is the output of our own actions, which you may call them war or conflict or something else. We also know that it is a impossible to change the perception of the people in the world today, going back to the discussion of Edward Said. Therefore, I would say those who ignore the rights and peace of humanity and continuously categorizing them as evil and bad, Center for Peace Study stands against, against this perception and to establish a peaceful and harmonious society for the humanity. As part of such initiatives, Center for Peace Studies have already organized a webinar and seminar on Rohingya genocide, justice and accountability of the Rohingyas, Israeli atrocities against the Palestines, and impact of military coup in Myanmar. And there will be a lot more on such issues in future from Center for Peace Studies.
I thank the department for law for extending their support, organizing such a timely webinar. I also thank Professor Norman for his wonderful insight on this issue. I thank Dr. Ishad for encouraging remarks on the issues of war and ongoing conflicts around the world. In my opinion, thank is not enough for Professor Klapon. You assist many of us opening a new eyes to look at the world today. I thank you for everything you have done today. I thank the support staff, my colleague, and those who joined this webinar and made this webinar as a successful event for North South University. I wish you all the best and also wish you safe and secure rest of this night or evening or morning during this difficult time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wahab. Uh, we are already out of time. So I once again thank you all. First of all, of course, to our speaker, our author, for his time. Also to my esteemed colleagues for their comments and the audience for their questions. This uh, events video would be uploaded in our YouTube channel, both the Center for Peace Studies YouTube channel and the Department of Law YouTube channel. So thank you all.